There we go. Good evening. Hello. Welcome to, uh, welcome to Lyman and Drugs Series 3, Episode 1. As always, to my sponsors, Mr. James Jeffries and Miss uh, Charlie Farrington. I'm always working at the other end to get us up and running um, and keep us up and running and afloat. Um, we're on Series 3. Um, nobody ever thought I'd last this long. It's brilliant. Um, tonight, uh, to kick off the series, I have uh, Claire Andrews, and Claire is going to share about her life. For the, it's her first podcast. Um, so it would be great just to uh, drop us some questions uh, you know, comments of encouragement. Um, this will be shared around some of the groups uh, that we're both uh, part of and some of the bigger groups. Claire, welcome. Thank you for having me. So let's go back to the start of your journey um, and the start of your story. So if I was to go back to the start of my journey... I would have to go right back to two things. And those two things would be trauma and adverse childhood experiences. Um, I had a very difficult start to life. Um, I was from a broken home, domestic violence, lost a safe parent, um, had a very... Um, very poorly little baby sister who was having open heart surgeries and had epilepsy. Um, there was alcoholism in the home. Um, and then at around about nine years old, um, I was sexually abused. So by the time I got to about 12 years old, I think I had an age score of 10. Um, I was groomed at 12 years old by a much older man, left home because I was um, obviously suffering from trauma, but back then nobody knew what that was. Um, and I was just very lost. Um, so I ended up leaving home at 12 years old. Um, I think I started smoking cannabis and drinking when I was about 11. Um, I remember my first attempt at taking my own life. I was about nine or ten after I lost my grandmother, um, who was one of the safe people around me. So after I um, ended up on the streets for a little while, I had to make friends with older people, try and find places to stay. And unfortunately, that took me into a world of drugs and chaos and predators and older men who were uh, taking advantage of young girls. Um, I was pregnant at 13 in a domestic abusive relationship and had a miscarriage. Um, then at 15, I was in a relationship with an older man and ended up pregnant again. And by this time I had been dabbling in the world of amphetamines. Um, stopped while I was pregnant and then after I'd had my daughter uh, it, the relationship became domestic there was domestic violence um, and I was smoking a lot of cannabis to try and uh, survive basically and then um, my ex-partner was in a world of drugs, dealing um, back and forth to Liverpool gangs and all sorts of stuff, all sorts of people coming to my house every day. I was just living in a world full of drugs. It was just violence and drugs, violence and drugs. Um, and then I had my son then at 18 and the violence got worse. Um, I went through sexual abuse during my teenage years uh twice or three times um and then that carried on into my 20s um i then started using amphetamine every day because i couldn't cope with life i couldn't i didn't really want to be here but i knew i couldn't leave because i needed to look after my kids but i wasn't strong enough to do that um and my will just became 
getting up, taking drugs and surviving to the next day. Um, and then when I was, I think I must have been about 25, I finally left my eldest children's father and my mother locked me in a room to get me off the amphetamines. Um, and that was a very traumatic experience. Um, so by this time, I was already dealing with complex trauma, but I knew nothing about trauma. Um, I knew I had mental health problems, but I was too scared to reach out for help because of the fear of losing my children. So I was basically uh, just living a double life. And then a couple of years after that, I met my uh, youngest dad. Um, and unfortunately, he was in the world of uh, heroin and crack cocaine. And then in 2009, I lost my baby sister. Um, sorry, I just got to take a breath. And my whole world was shattered. So I started to use heroin. Um, and then that went on then for 15 years. Um, and obviously you think, oh, you know, it's not going to catch me. I'll just have one go and it's not going to catch me. Um, and before you know it, bam, you're hooked. And you can't go a day without it. Um, so, yeah, I lived a double life for a long time. I was mum and I was, you know, in like acting mode. And then I was in drug addict mode. And I was just trying to get from one day to another. I had a lot of pain that needed to be dealt with but didn't know who to go to or how to deal with that pain. And then that pain using became a way to numb that pain. Um, so yeah, I had my son in 2016. My kids were grown up by then. I was smoking heroin and crack every day. And I knew that I could not hide this addiction for another 18 years while my son was in school. So I said, I've got to do something about this by the time you start school. Um, I then by accident found out about adverse childhood experiences uh, through being online on NA and CA and just researching because I started researching about myself, trying to figure out what was going on because there just was no help for me. There was no support. Every time I went to the doctors, I was told I had depression, but I knew it was more than depression. Um, fed uh, mental health medication from the time I was 15 years old. Um, and I found out about adverse childhood experiences. And the moment I read about that and what that meant, my whole life just fell into place. I knew, I understood like, who I was as a person, why this stuff had happened to me, why I felt the way I had, why I'd been a drug addict for all these years. And I just started researching and, and trying to find tools to be able to get myself clean. Um, so I started doing NA and CA. Um, I started going to church. Never believed in God in my life. I did when I was little. But then all those things happened and I was like, well, where the hell is God? Where is he? Like, well, how can he let these things happen? So my beliefs just went out the window. And um, there was a few things that happened that made me realise that there was something out there. Um, so I was sat outside the front and... I was ready to end my life because I just couldn't get clean. I remember being sat in my house with a Bible in one hand and a crack pipe in the other, begging for help, but not knowing who to go to and what to do. And I was on Subutex at the time. Um, and I was sat at the front. I was just ready to end my life. And all of a sudden, these big, massive circles just came floating over the house. And like, there were six of them. And I'd lost six people who were really dear to me. 
And I literally just said, like, if there's anything there, because they went, they went away, they came and then they went. And uh, my friend just sat with me at the time. She was like, what the hell was that? And then I was, I just stood up and I was just like, if there's anything there, please, I need you. Like, I need help. Just prove to me and just come back. And then one came back, two came back, another one came back. And I went to bed that night and I don't know what happened, but something changed in my mind. And I woke up the next day and I literally fought for my life from there. Um, then we went into COVID and I got off the heroin a year before. So I got off the heroin in 2000, March 2019. Um, and I was still smoking crack a year after that, but I was smoking one day, then going a few days without, then smoking again, then going a week without, then smoking again, and going two weeks without. And I remember I had a calendar in the kitchen and I'd been to my family and I'd said, look, this is what's going on. I need help. This is what I'm doing. Um, I'm gonna mark down the days I use on the calendar so everybody knows where I am. And I remember, over that period of a year, the first, I've still got the calendar now and, and it's amazing, like the first month, every day has got a cross on it. The next, the next month, maybe there's four days that haven't. Then the next month after that, there's a week or two weeks. And I could just see that progress coming. So I carried on going to church, carried on doing NA and CA, was doing the 12 steps, but it, it just wasn't all working on its own. So I realized that I had to sort of, make up my own little program for me to stick to and just to try and do it that way. Um, and then we went into lockdown. So obviously we were all locked in our homes. There was no drug dealers around. Nobody could leave the house. Um, and for all of the heartache lockdown caused, because uh, I lost my grandpa. The last day I ever used was the day I lost my grandpa, and that was the 13th of July, 2020. Um, but for all the heartache that that year caused, it saved my life. Um, and I was in the services at this time, and I'd been back and forth, and they were putting a lot of pressure on me, but they weren't really helping or giving me tools or, you know, trying to help me get clean. And I wanted to come off the sub tax. They were like, no, 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 you're not ready. But I was ready. I just wanted to do it. Um, so we went into lockdown. And I didn't hear from any service for around six months, I think it was. And then one day I got a knock at the door. And I went outside. And there was two nurses stood on my doorstep in the middle of my street. And my two-year-old son was next, stood next to me. And there was nothing about my addiction because I, I protected him from that. I'm trying to break this cycle for him because I've already damaged two kids. And she's got a bag in her hand and she said, oh, we just thought we'd knock the door and uh, check on you. We've got some stuff for you. So I thought, oh, okay, then. Didn't really want to engage with them because I hadn't heard nothing from them. Um, and then at the end of the conversation, in the middle of the street, she pulls out a drug test and says, right, while we're here, do you mind going inside and doing this for me? So I took the pot off her, came inside, went into the toilet. I was just literally like blown away. And I went into the bathroom and I just heard a voice in my head say, don't you dare do that test. Like I was already clean by this point. Um, I was still on the subby tax um, and I was still smoking crack occasionally. So something in my head said, don't do the test. So I took the test back outside and I said, I'm really sorry. I haven't heard from you for months. You've just come here, knocked my door, done an interview in the street and broken confidentiality. My son is stood right next to me who knows nothing about what's going on. So no, I'm not doing the test. You can take that and you can take it back. I said, and while I'm here, you can stick your subby tax pres prescription. I don't want it anymore. And I shut the door. So I went down to the doctors. I thought I've got to cover my ass. So I went down to the doctors and I was like, right, this is what's happened. And he was, he was horrified, absolutely horrified about the way I'd been treated. I said, I want, I want you to do a test because if, if they say now I've avoided the test because I was using, that's not the case. I want you to take the test so you know that I'm clear. 
uh, and I want to come off this medication. So he did the test and he was like, look, there's no way you're going to get off this. It's going to take you months and months and months. And I said to him, we'll see about that. I came home, locked myself in the house and I went cold turkey off 24 mils of Subutax a day and crack cocaine over a three week period. I don't know how I'm still alive. It caused me oh, yeah. to have post-acute withdrawal syndrome for a year after. I don't advise anybody to do it. My son witnessed everything that I went through and it was the worst withdrawal of my entire life, but it was so beneficial to me. Um, so yeah, COVID just saved my life. COVID saved my life. So I carried on with church. Uh, I started my own recovery group originally to document my journey so I had something to look back on uh, that group now has uh, over 500 members um, and helps quite a lot of people I met a lot of wonderful people along the way there's too many to mention William Anderson, Jay Haston, Scott Bolger we all help each other out we're all there to trying to do the same thing um, and I just feel like I've been called to spread awareness, to share my story, to share my pain and to turn pain into purpose. And I want to break the cycle for my children. I know I'm too late with the eldest and I've caused them a lot of pain and a lot of trauma. Um, but I want to break the cycle for my youngest. I want to break the cycle for my grandchildren. And I want to show them that no matter what happens to you in life, you can always turn it around. Yeah, you can, you can. Um, I identify so much with your story on so many levels. Um, you know, um, especially when it comes to cold turkey, I, I, I couldn't stop for loving our money. I couldn't stop for me. I couldn't stop for my kids. I couldn't stop for God. I couldn't stop for anything. And I was crying out for, for people and nobody would help me. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the services wouldn't help me. Yeah. Services wouldn't help me. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, and I uh, found myself sat in a crack house, uh, you know, praying for freedom or death. Yeah. Um, turns out I got freedom. So that was the last time I used 2014. But, um, you know, it's... It must have took a lot for you to fight your way through that. I remember that question in my head. I remember that question. I'd been smoking crack one night and I'd been smoking it for so long and I was having palpitations and I was getting dizzy. And I literally nearly had, a, I think I nearly had a heart attack. I really think I did. I rang the ambulance. They wouldn't send anyone because it was on record that I had anxiety. And I went to bed that night and I left a note on the bed for my children. I wrote them a letter because I honestly believed that I wasn't going to be here the, the next morning. And I remember that the question in my head that night was, it's time. Do you want to live or do you want to die? Like, that's where I am now. I could never pick up another drink or drug ever again because I know in my head it equals death. It does. It does. Um, you know, I'm... I'm quite blessed to have a very loving church behind yeah. me. You mentioned about having, having church. That's a big one for me because... Um, you know, when I was using um, uh, and homeless and things like that, we knew when the Christians were coming because we knew we'd get a hot meal or, you know, we'd, we'd, we'd get a hot drink or we'd get a bit of money, a bit of tobacco money. Um, I'd experienced some churches that were on the questionable side, I would say. I'm right um, quite, there with you on that one. Quite close to cult, cultish. Um, but when I um, met my now wife, 
um, at, at the food bank, I was introduced to a sort of a whole new sort of church. And, and, and this church, I started coming in, you know, in my hometown where I now live uh, with my family. And they were with me right by my side um, from when I first got clean um, mm -hmm. and to when I ended up in hospital having my, uh, you know, dying and going to hell and then coming back and then having my total breakdown. They were people from my church sat by my bed every day listening to me, scream and shout at them, spit at them, try and attack them uh, physically and verbally. Um, and they just sat there and they just told me that they loved me. I'd never had that before. Or I had had that before, but they loved me because they thought they could get something from something me. Something out of you, yeah. Um, and I used church, you know, I used churches because um, I thought I could get something out of them. You know, um, it was, a, like I say, it was a hot meal or it was, you know, uh, um, just a bit of an easier, easier ride. But when I did find God, it totally changed me. And unlike you said, I think I can pretty much say I will never go back to that. I will, I will never pick up again, purely because when I first, I had quite a few years of sobriety, but when I first um, like came back into sobriety, I had that church behind me and they really started to, teach me emotional intelligence they started to teach me how to deal with my trauma they started to teach me how to deal with the ptsd they taught me how to pray properly they um you know and they helped along with my you know life helped turn me into a a different man yeah, um, yeah. now i always say that a different man came back today after he died um but there are still people out there that believe that there are people like us that um will never truly change i i hear it all the time they'll say like a leopard can't change its spots oh I hate well, no 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 that's that's an exterior thing uh, you yeah. know a leopard can't change its spots but it can change its behavior yeah it and its know, environment it its yeah. environment it can be tamed um you know uh, and it's left to people like us to have to educate. Yeah. Um, and my experience with God has been a bit different to that because I found two churches which were really for me. Um, I was baptised in uh, 20, summer of 2021, um, and it literally changed my life. Um but I've had more of a personal relationship with God. So I, I even though I've got godly friends and yeah. I've got that fellowship, I don't go to church because I'm sadly haven't been able to find one that I fit in at. Um, so every Sunday, my, my, my kitchen is my church and I've got a wonderful church in America, which I've done from the very beginning of my journey. And um, it just keeps me humble. And I've had so many things where, because there was a time in my recovery in uh, 2019, I lost everything. I lost my benefits. I lost my home. I never had any money for a whole year. Um, and I had a little baby and I couldn't feed us. So, you know, I had nothing. I was living on food banks and services. And there was days where I'd get up and I, and I never had no bread or milk. And there'd be a card posted through from a church with money in and I'd be like but how the hell do they know I need money how the hell like people say it's a coincidence but I don't believe in that anymore I don't believe in coincidences no I, I, there's a great saying uh, which is when I pray coincidences happen when yeah I don't they don't yeah you know I like to I pray for everything Oh, I'm me. I'm terrible. Like morning, noon and night. I'm praising all the time. Every little blessing I have, like I'm so grateful for life. It's a good way to be. It's a great way to be. You know, we rely, you know, I, I rely on God. My family rely on God. Um, you know, people say, oh, God never gives you more than, more you, than can you can handle. handle. But he does. 
because it teaches us to rely on him um yeah. and that's what i do um i i've learned to rely on him um, and as a family we've learned to rely on him you know when i've needed shoes i've prayed for shoes and i've gone to church um a couple of days later and there's a member of my church that's stood there going oh jack i've got a bag of shoes for you yeah um, you know we were crazy, clearing out my boy's it? room yeah. um you know people have dropped money through the door um like you um you know, the, the church have been absolutely fantastic when it comes to, um, you know, at the start of it, uh, helping out with the kids and helping out. Uh, and that's what, that's all I needed, that love um, yeah. that I starved myself of. Um, yeah. And that connection, because addiction is the total absence of connection. Um, so when we go into recovery and we start to get clean and sober that connection starts to happen and you know we need that part of this for doing this for me yeah. um, is connection with other people in the wider world um, part of it is to be able to give other people like yourself a voice uh, and another part of it is part of service because I serve God and I always talk about God in some way yeah. No matter what podcast I'm doing, whether it's my podcast or someone else's, I always share my love um, for God and my, my relationship with Christ because it's important. Yeah, um, definitely. And I also, I've got a different outlook on it now. Like before, before all of this, before recovery, before God, before the 12 stuff, before all of that, I was a person that was always looking at the, at the glass as half empty, very negative, woe is me this is wrong with me, that's wrong with me. And since the transformation, instead of me sitting there thinking, well, where was he? Where was he? Now I know that he was there, but these things had to happen to bring me to the person I am now to be able to do the things I'm doing now, you know, like with the Wave Trust and the Heart of Ace and the group and Room Redux and Aruka Project and everything I'm doing, Half Sea Trust, he's built me for greatness. He's built me to be able to share love and hope and compassion and empathy. And I can do anything through Christ. And, and he strengthens me every day. I could be going through the worst thing in my life in this day and age right now. But I know as long as I keep that faith, everything is going to be OK. And I know that there's a lesson in everything that I go through. I've just got to look for it. Yeah, I, I think it's quite easy to think, well, God's not watching or, you know, this is happening and, and, and uh, you know, I can't see God. I can't hear God anymore, you know, yeah. when you've been able to hear him. But there's a difference between hearing and listening. Yeah. So there are times when I've, 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 I've hit, the, you know, difficult times and I've had to rely on God. Uh, and I've had to pull myself back from saying, you, um, yeah, you know, it's, it's you, you, you've done this to me. You're, you're, you're. But we have to realize that we can't change that. Why does God allow these things to happen? Well, because he does. He allows it. We don't know, we don't that know why. We yeah. will not probably never know why you know or we won't know why until we're you know standing with him in heaven but um i do believe that um you know he, he's always there even when we feel it you know he's especially there when we feel when he isn't so when we were at the lowest of the low when we were sat in that crack house with that pipe in hand and when we were sat doing sketchy shady stuff um to try and get by when we were um living a life full of uh, violence and lies and hurt and hate and all this and when we were but you know um uh when we were treating ourselves you know when we were treating our own pain with 
um, class A's and, and, and stuff like that. God was there. We just, it's not that we couldn't see him. It's that we refused to see him. Um, it's the reason why I'm sat here today. It's the yeah. reason that you're sat here today. It's the reason that we're not dead because we could have been yeah. dead many times over. Oh, do you know what? Honestly, I don't know how. I don't know how I'm still here. In all the things I've done, like I was, a, I was an addict for 25 years. 25 years. Like I've lost friends. I've seen people close to me die of overdoses. I don't know how I'm still here. Well, God wants you here. Um, God wants us both here. He's, he's, he's clearly got a. He's, he's clearly got a, a reason. He's, he's clearly got a calling for us. Yeah. Um, and it is why I do what I do, and it's why you do what you do. Um, if we've lived a certain way of life, it is our responsibility to educate about that way of life. Um, you know, we need sobriety. I've lost people to suicide and um, murder. Yeah. And um, I forgave the man that murdered my two day old niece, and he was murdered by his cellmate. And, you know, I gave up the anger. And, you know, you hear it a lot surrender to win. But I wouldn't surrender. And, and you know, I, I guess there's times when you wouldn't surrender because you were too stubborn. I to... think for me, I think for me, it was the forgiveness part. It was hard to forgive. But what I didn't realise until a few years ago was the only person that anger and that not wanting to forgive people was affecting was me. Yep. Exactly, exactly. Anger, bitterness, resentment, um, you know, unforgiveness. It's a poison, right? Yeah. And if we're angry at someone else, are they bothered about it? Well, no, probably no. not. Is it affecting them as much as it's affecting us? And once you realise that, you know, being... Unforgiveness is like drinking poison and expecting the other person to die. Yeah. And there's so many times I've been bent up on my hands and knees, crying in church um, because I couldn't forgive. Yeah. I couldn't forgive someone else or I couldn't forgive myself. Um, there's many times when I couldn't forgive myself and I would pick up and use because yeah. that's the way that we dealt with trauma. Yeah. We didn't have a drug problem. We had a trauma problem. Drugs was uh, drugs, alcohol, you know, that um, that was the, um, you know, that was the way that we dealt with it. Yeah. And that's what um, I try and fight for now. Like I went to doctors for years and they just wanted to stick plasters over it, give medication. But realistically, if they have dealt with the trauma, when I was 12 years old and I've been through a miscarriage and I've been groomed and somebody has actually said to me, what's happened to you? And opened that door for dialogue. It could have saved my life then. You know, we have to stop saying, right, okay, you're an addict, right? Well, we'll deal with the addiction first. And once you stop using, we'll deal with the mental health. And then once the mental health's dealt with, we'll deal with the PTSD. And then once that's dealt with, we'll deal with the anxiety. Because what I found in my recovery now is I've had to go through all of that. Mm -hmm. So the first thing I had to deal with was the addiction. Then it was the anxiety. Then it's the PTSD. Then it's the panic attacks. And now four years later, I'm still stuck on a waiting list, waiting for trauma therapy. When in essence, if I would just had that therapy, four years ago, 10 years ago, it would have saved me a lifetime of addiction. It would have yeah. saved my family and my children a lifetime of pain. And I have passed so much trauma onto my own children from then having to witness their mother 
being a drug addict all their lives and having to accept that I wasn't there emotionally and I let them down and they never had nice things and we were always poor and there was no food in the fridge and they couldn't have their friend drowned and I was upstairs in my room constantly pop popping up and down smoking drugs while they were in their bedroom like it was horrific mm. and I just you know I was angry over that for a very long time like and I, I still get angry over that now yeah and I, I, I can understand that 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 that, well, that used to I used to follow me up that day that you know the guilt and the shame of what my kid, you know, what my kids are seeing, what my daughter's seen, yeah, um, what trauma that's caused, uh, what trauma that's caused around other people, and I would use on the trauma that I thought I or that I had caused other people, yeah, um, and I had to learn to forgive myself, um, and it came at an unusual time. It came at the, uh, you know, at my niece's funeral. And it came with the clarity that you only really get when you when you're so angry and then you you hit something or you kick something or you trip over something and you hurt yourself. And that, you know, it's that clarity that only comes with that second after pain, that that calmness before yeah. that pain then starts to set in, you know, when you when your body is then in into um basically fight mode. Fight or flight. Fight yeah, or and I, yeah. I knew that I had to forgive him for what he did, even though he was dead, because it was tearing me up. You yeah. know, sat in the car crying um, after the funeral. I knew that I had to forgive my abusers. I knew that I had yeah. to forgive myself. I knew that I had to stop with this guilt and shame that was pulling my heart apart. I knew that I had to stop... Um, feeling bad for what other people might feel um we're very blessed today yeah. um, you know, i'm very blessed today to have you know some of my family back in my life yeah for a long time they wouldn't talk to me yeah i'm going talk. through that now at the moment my son you know i speak to my eldest daughter but my son has just found this so difficult and i totally get it you know i put pain on them they've been in pain all, all their lives and they don't trust you as the person you're showing up as today because what happens if they trust you and then next week you relapse? And that's been one of the biggest losses from this. It's no, my son, that. losing my son. Um, but I still stand on faith today that I will continue to work hard and I will continue to prove that, you know, I'm done and I will continue to help as many other families and children as I can and I just want to show them a better life. And I think a big thing for me was accountability and yes. actually learning to say, yes, I did that. Yes, I shouldn't have. I'm sorry. This is what I'm going to do to make it right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, what you can do is you can ask for forgiveness. Then it's down to, you know, as hard as it might seem, as hard as it might sound, it's then down to the other person. Yeah, you can forgive yourself. Um, you know, I I have a, a a really good friend that I talk to. His name is um, Bill Holbert. Um, he was a cartel hitman, and he's currently serving four to six years in a Panamanian prison for a quintuple homicide. Wow! And he found Christ, and I asked him. Do you not feel guilt or shame for what you did? And he said, well, I'm forgiven. You know, what's guilt and shame going to do but tear me apart? Yeah. You know, it's going to tear my relationship apart. And that's not what Christ wants. Christ wants a relationship with me. He wants a relationship with you. He wants a relationship with everybody. Christ wasn't the conservative. Yeah. He, he didn't just have these little exclusive relationships with um, uh, church leaders. You know, we all knew, know that, that Christ and religion don't go together. 
I always Christ say King. he's close to the sinner. He's closer to the sinners than he is the saints. That's exactly. one thing I've learned. Exactly. Christ came to have relationships with people like you and me. And, you know, we hung about with people like you and me. Yeah, and people, yeah. You know, Paul was, a, you know, Saul Paul, he murdered Christians. Yeah, yeah. And not, and not just a couple. You know, he murdered hundreds of people. Yeah. And he was forgiven. Um, and, you know, if if Christ can forgive Bill, well, then I guess I can. Um, and it's not always easy. There are things in my life, there are people in my life that I don't want to forgive right at this minute. Yeah, but it'll come. It will come. One of my greatest heroes of faith um, is a woman called Corrie Ten Boone. Now, Corrie Ten Boone was a... Um, she was only a young woman when the Nazis occupied Holland uh, and her and her whole family were taken to um, a, a Nazi death camp it, it, you know one of the worst ones I'm, I'm not sure whether it was Auschwitz or somewhere, somewhere else but um, she hid girls from Nazi captains men she saved people uh, people from being raped. You know, she lost her sister. Her sister was murdered and, and uh, raped and murdered in, in, in this camp. And years later, she was, she was at a speaking event and people were waiting to speak to her afterwards. And this man came up and she recognised him straight away as the most sadistic, horrible human being that she'd ever met one of the worst guards at the camp. Wow. And he said, I've found Christ. Can you please forgive me? Wow. And she thought, no, I can't forgive, you know, in her head she was like, no, I can't forgive you. You, 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 you you're horrible. You, you know, you've, you've done this to all these people and you've dealt death and all this. And then she got this voice saying, well, no, I can't forgive, but, God can, so that's good enough for me. And she yeah. embraced him with a hug. You know, that is, to me, something that, you know, th that level of forgiveness that I aspire to. Yeah, definitely. Especially And I myself. also think, for me, um, I didn't know love. I didn't know love. As far as I knew love, it came, it hurt you, it left, it died, it beat you, it raped you, it, it hurt, you know what I mean? It tears your life apart, I never knew it. And I couldn't, I never loved myself, never loved myself, didn't know how to. Because of that, I couldn't really love other people. So there was like barriers that I put up with my children as they were growing up because I was fearful if I get too close and something happens to them, what am I going to do? And if anything, my faith has taught me the meaning of love and what, and the Bible has taught me what love actually is. And I know I'm so loved and I know I'm wonderfully and beautifully made and I am who I am. And I don't really care what anybody thinks of me. God knows my heart. God knows where I've come from and what I've done. And I'm just so, so, so blessed, so blessed. You are, you are. And to um, come on here and to speak your story, to speak your truth is a blessing to uh, lots of other people, myself included. Um, we'll end on this. Um, if you can say one thing to someone out there that's struggling at the minute, what would it be? Um, it first of all would be to say that you're going to be okay. Um, to reach out and seek help, whether that's from doctors or friends or groups or church or, um, you know, and to just keep hold of hope because there is hope, and people do change. 
and you're strong and you're worthy and none of this is your fault, none of it. Thank you. Um, we will, uh, uh, after this, um, I will link um, Claire's groups. Um, I will link my group, the Council of Survivors Voices. Um, if anybody wants signposting to anyone, um, drop me a message here on the Accidental Journalist, and we'll try and um, we'll try and get you um, signposted. Thank you, as always. Um, to those that tune in ev every week, um, week on, week off, to support me and to support the people that come on this journey with me and, and the ones that share their stories. The, the, you know, our stories are the essence of who we are. Um, and I believe that a, a powerful story can be a powerful thing, a powerful tool in the lives of many. So, Claire, thank you again for um, coming on and, and, and sharing your, your, your truth and your story. Um, and thanks, guys. Um, I will sign off and I shall see you again next week. Thank you. Thank you, guys. I'll see you soon.